Well, hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and today I'm going to do part two of my lecture on the GI tract, and we're going to cover the lower GI tract, the small intestine and the colon. In the previous lecture, we covered the oral cavity through the stomach. And before we get started, as I do with all my lectures, I want to thank my friends and colleagues who provided me such fantastic images over the years, which allow me to put these lectures together. When we think about the small intestine of the horse, it's plagued with a lot of infectious diseases from birth to death and every time in between. But the one that can be the most tricky is salmonellosis. In most cases, it's Salmonella typhimurium. There aren't really any host adapted versions for the horse, like cattle have Salmonella Dublin, pigs have Salmonella cholera suis. It's pretty much Salmonella typhimurium, but it causes a wide range of lesions in the intestine of the horse. In terms of location, you can find it anywhere from the duodenum through the colon. You can see acute lesions, you can see chronic lesions that result in stricture. And very few cases look alike. Salmonella has been referred to as the great imposter. It is a necrotizing enterocolitis, so what we would expect in the prototypical case is to see a necrotic membrane with necrosis which actually starts in the pyrus patches and moves to cover the surface of the mucosa and you will see this yellowish flaky material that's very characteristic of a diphtheritic or necrotic membrane. You can often see it in the duodenum and in acute cases the animal may have fluid stomach contents. When it only involves a duodenum, you have to rule out a condition which is referred to as anterior enteritis, which has been sort of a mystery condition for many years, which may result from salmonella, but also clostridium perfringens, and even aspergillus has been isolated from those cases. Here's another case of salmonella that looks a little worse. The the mucosa underlying the necrotic membrane is a lot more red, and the membrane itself is thicker. It's great to have one where you can identify necrosis, and it's often associated with a pretty awful smell of sewage. But it can look like just about any, anything else. Here's one in which the intestine is just very edematous, and there are areas of congestion. They can actually almost look normal just with enlarged lymph nodes. This is where histology comes in. And one of the things that you wanna look for, and that's going to be very helpful in making the basic determination of an infectious disease in the horse gut versus a twist, which we're gonna talk about, and uh, um, is another common cause of colic and death due to gastrointestinal distress is you look histologically at the vessels. Cases of infectious disease generally have vasculitis and thrombosis. Here's another case of salmonella which is nothing but a lot of petechiation. Don't remember, don't, sorry, don't forget that salmonella is a gram-negative organism. When the body kills it, it releases endotoxin from its wall. And one of the many things that endotoxin does is it whacks endothelial cells. So it kills off the endothelium, exposes the underlying collagen, and then you get widespread thrombosis. Salmonella may also be a sign of immunosuppression, and you may look for other signs of immunosuppression, such as uh, candida, as we've previously seen on the tongue or in the esophagus. One other thing to think about when you see salmonella is the possibility for secondary 
mycotic infection in the lungs. A great paper published in VetPath a number of years ago, in the mid-90s, um, when they looked at animals with mycotic pneumonia. This is embolic. And it turns out that the, the fungus originates in the inflamed gut of, of horses, generally with salmonella, and gets through the breaks in the mucosa into the bloodstream and ends up resulting in these bullseye-looking targetoid hemorrhagic lesions in the lung. Now, let's look at a young foal. My hat is off to uh, my good friend Paco Zal on this slide and so many of the other ones that he supplied over the years. He has done just phenomenal work with clostridiosis in production animals and horses and cattle and small ruminants. Um, I don't subscribe to the notion that clostridium is the cause of every disease of the horse, but it certainly turns up on a regular basis, um, especially in foals. Williams' rule of red gut in a horse or a cow or a pig is that until proven otherwise, you're probably dealing with salmonella, at least if it's a young animal. Um, salmonella perfringens, type C or type A in the horse, are toxins that we see in young animals because they have an immature immune system. They tend to absorb it wholesale uh, through the gut because the gut at this time is primed to absorb clostridium and they don't have uh, the enzyme turned on yet to break down sophisticated proteins. This gut of this young animal is programmed to take antibodies from the colostrum and pretty much anything else that comes in during that time period. So this is why we see clostridium perfringens, especially type C in these animals within the first several days of life. The lesion's not difficult to, uh, to see. This is a focally extensive and segmental necrohemorrhagic enteritis. Remember, when you see red, you're probably looking at necrosis. You're looking at hemorrhage, yes, I get that. But, but there, it usually, in almost all cases, accompanies necrosis. But the color of necrosis is really a loss of color. And so it gets covered up by anything that's darker, like hemorrhage in the area. And that's a great uh, thing to remember from my good friend Paul Stromberg. He calls it the fine arts rule. Hemorrhage covers everything up. So if you're looking at hemorrhage, remember you're probably looking at necrosis. Um, for that morphologic diagnosis, if you just told me it's hemorrhagic enteritis, I'm not giving you full credit. I need to know that you know that this is a severe necrotizing process. These organisms are living on the top of the mucosa. They are secreting a, uh, uh, a toxin that acts like a perforin. And you can just see the wave of necrosis going down into the mucosa. The toxin isn't just restricted to the gut because the lining of the gut's necrotic. Um, it will get into the bloodstream. So you will often see ecchymosis uh, and necrosis in multiple organs and sometimes even see bacterial emboli. Uh, these animals don't make it very well. Another thing that, that you want to take a look at here is the fact that these loops of gut are stuck together. They're sort of they don't have a nice shiny appearance. And that's because of the fibrin that you see over the affected loops of guts in animals with uh, severe necrosis of the intestines. So this clostridium perfringens, pretty much type C in young foals. Okay, uh, we've talked about this, and we, we mentioned this in the section on hemolymphatic, and we are looking at the mucosa of the intestine in a case of granulomatous enteritis. If we took a section, we would see tremendous numbers of histiocytes. It sort of resembles Yoni's disease in a cow, and the cause of this is still unknown, although about 50% of these cases you can identify mycobacterium in it. Um, it's not a pure population of histiocytes. You can also see neutrophils and eosinophils too. As you would expect, if an animal's intestinal mucosa is just cram-packed full of histiocytes, you're probably going to have protein loss. So these animals may also have hyperproteinemia, subcutaneous edema, 
and various effusions. It's not just the intestine. Um, the stomach and the colon can be affected as well, but the intestine and the mesenteric lymph nodes are where most of the lesions are seen. This seems to be a bit more of a historic disease and other cases still out there, but not like um, we used to see back in the 90s. This belongs to a, a group of diseases that everyone wants to draw uh, some sort of connection with Crohn's disease in people, but it's never really been done. Um, Granny Lama's disease in horses, Young's disease in cattle, a boxer colitis, which is due to E. coli. Everybody wants to say, oh, that's the, that's the, uh, the animal version of Crohn's disease, which has a similar histologic picture, but uh, they seem to be independent diseases. Here's another boggy look, very boggy looking intestine, very edematous, uh, probably a lot of, of macrophages within the mucosa. And I just put this up to, uh, uh, to bring up the, the fact that uh, M. avium uh, in immunosuppressed animals often will cause a granulomatous enteritis. M. avium is everywhere we look, everywhere we touch. As I take a, another sip of coffee this morning, Boy, that's good. The rim of the cup probably had uh, a bunch of M. avium on it. My desk does and everything I touch, but I'm immunocompetent. At least I hope I am, so I, my body takes care of it. But in immunosuppressed animals, um, M. avium is most often ingested. So the lesions that we will see in horses and pigs and, and uh, uh, chickens, whatever, are going to be... Uh, lesions of the intestine and the mesenteric lymph nodes. In severely disseminate, or severely immunosuppressed animals, they will disseminate. So whenever I see a, a granulomous inflammation of the gut, I want to think about uh, M. avium. And then finally, in a foal, uh, especially a, uh, a foal within, uh, in Kentucky, I want to think about a condition caused by Lawsonia, intracellularity, the same agent that causes necrotic ileitis in pigs and wet tail in hamsters and proliferative colitis in ferrets um, will affect the small intestines. It's usually seen in foals. It's an emerging disease in areas that uh, produce a lot of horses and the primary clinical sign is hypoproteinemia and subcutaneous edema. And because you can test for this with PCR, the feces, when one of those animals is identified clinically, that's usually the first, uh, the first thing that's tested for. If it's positive, the animals can be treated. Um, it's most often seen in horses in the ileum, so you'll have a lot of histiocytes, you'll have some edema and hyperproteinemia. A diarrhea is sort of an inconsistent finding in this particular, and you would think, well, you have granulomous inflammation, but, uh, you know, you don't see a lot. It's probably due to the, the vast absorptive capacity of the uh, equine colon. In very rare cases, in older horses, not in the foals, but older horses, you can see a similar proliferation of the gut lining, um, which in pigs has been called adenomatosis. It's a rare manifestation of this, and usually in older animals. Where does it come from? Did it originally come from pigs? Nobody knows, but, but foals certainly can be affected with Lawsonia intracellulare. Enteroliths. Uh, these are considered good luck, and they have been for thousands of years. Um, Enteroliths are a, uh, an accretion of mineral. The minerals that normally are circulating in the gut fluids. And the most common minerals that we see in these are magnesium, ammonium, and phosphate. There's a lot of uh, uh, literature talking about various predispositions. Uh, Arabians and, and Arabian crosses appear to be more prone to developing enteroliths. And in certain parts of the country, like California, they may make up 40% of the reported cases. Also Morgans and Saddlebreds and other species like warm blood seem to be less prone to the stone formation. 
certain types of hay, uh, such as alfalfa, um, has been incriminated, especially if the horse is getting more than 50% uh, in its diet because it's high in calcium and magnesium and various proteins, which uh, create a high level of mineral concentration in the intestine. Uh, a high pH uh, within the cecum has been associated with the enterolith formation. Um, these tend to get caught um, uh, in areas where the, uh, where the intestine narrows as the colon ends up in, in, or sorry, as the intestine, the ileum, ends up going into the colon. Anywhere where there is a narrowing, you can get enteroliths uh, when, the, when the colon dumps into the small colon. Uh, you can see that. People have said that they're more common in the right dorsal colon because it's wider and there's less propulsion, there's less strength of the peristalsis. So um, there's more like, likely for these accretions to form and hang around there without getting pushed farther down into the gut. And one thing that uh, uh, Dr. John King always used to say is to cut these in half and you'll often find that at the center of them is a small rock, a pebble, maybe a small piece of nail, or even the husk of a seed because these need a something to form around, something that, that potentially forms a magnetic field that starts to attract some of these mineral. Um, it's an interesting theory, and certainly if you cut enough of them, you will find in the center some little hard piece of rock or something that might have started as a nidus for the formation of this enterolith. Can we talk for a moment about displacements? And I'm only going to talk for a moment because it's something that is very difficult to demonstrate and I think some, some good general uh, guidelines on these are probably as good as showing a lot of pictures. This particular one uh, arose in a horse that colic. It is the result of a rent in the mesentery and incarceration of the intestine. Um, as I've mentioned before, my friend Fabio Del Piero told me years ago, and he was very right, that... The horse is simply a GI tract looking for trouble, and it is going to twist, and it will find any type of hole that it can get into and get stuck. And the problem is when it gets stuck because of the bacteria which normally live in there, they can they don't know that the gut has become stuck. They continue to produce gas. And when you look at a big red gut, and I've already said that the, the Williams number rule of red guts in a horse is that until proven otherwise, it's clostridium. Well, well, this one is red too, and there's no clostridium in here, but the difference, the basic difference grossly between infectious diseases in horses and incarcerations is the amount of gas. It looks like somebody has pumped this up with a bicycle pump and that's what tells you that it's incarcerated there's no way for the gas to escape and it's going to build up it's just as red and inflamed as an infectious disease if you get to the histology of this believe it or not you can you can twist the gut three or four times and let it sit there for a couple of hours but you don't get thrombosis in the vessels. That's because you have to have endotoxin to damage the endothelium to strip it. The thrombosis occurs when the endothelium is gone. Here the endothelium is intact so you don't get thrombosis even though we would think that with hours of stasis you would have a lot of thrombi. You just don't have them. So with incarcerations look for the fact that they have been inflated. This one is a venous infarction. It is bright red Okay, we looked earlier at, uh, at an arterial infarction, which is blanched. Uh, so venous infarctions, when the gut twists, they're the first to be blocked because they don't have a lot of blood pressure, so they become very engorged. Um, they will leak blood, and you get this very red appearance. An, artar an arterial function, uh, a, a arterial infarction is very difficult to get from a twist, and that would be very pale. 
if you could do it. So, infarction versus inflammatory disease. Know the basics, look at them grossly, and look at them histologically to double check and make sure. Okay, we talked about in the last lecture on the upper GI tract, we talked about hypertrophy of the muscular wall of the distal esophagus where it goes into the stomach. Another spot that you will see muscular hypertrophy uh, of the wall of the gastrointestinal tract is in the ileum. Uh, ileal muscular hypertrophy is not an uncommon finding. Nobody knows what causes it. It may be a sequela to a functional obstruction um, where the ileum moves into the cecum. Um, and a functional obstruction is one that you really can't see but it obviously has caused this secondary. It's difficult for the ingestion to be pushed in, so you have muscular hypertrophy. In the vast majority of cases, there is no uh, signs associated with it. But every once in a while, you will get a horse in which there is a, a weak spot in that hypertrophied muscle. Remember that when you, when you uh, uh, build up your muscles big, if you're one of those people that goes to the gym and you lift some really heavy weights, you know, you are building muscles. You are making those individual myofibers bigger. You break them down and they come back bigger than normal in response to that heavy weight. What you are not building is fibrous connective tissue. So people go to the gym a lot, they're often, they come away, they're sore, they tend to get injured more, they have more muscular ruptures, um, because you can make your muscles as big as you want, but nothing is going to increase the fibrous connective tissue. And that's what happened here. A big, uh, you have big hypertrophy of this muscle, and one little area where the fibrous connective tissue just wasn't strong enough, and this is called a pulsion diverticulum. Okay, um, there are two types of diverticular. You have traction diverticular, which is usually the result of scarring and contraction, and pulsion diverticulum, where you have a weakness in the muscle, and that mucosa is just sort of going to pooch out, and you're going to get uh, food trapped in here, and it is going to become inflamed, and it could perforate. So it's an uncommon finding of, uncommon sequela of a common finding in the horse of distal ileal muscular hypertrophy. We're into the colon now, and here we have some large red worms. And these are the large strongyles we've already mentioned once or twice. Um, we talked about, when we talked about cranial mesenteric arteries, we talked about strongyles vulgaris and how the lesion in the mesenteric artery is due to the last two stages, L4 and L5, of their larval development. And then they go into the colon and they look like this. These are hemophagic parasites. That's why they're red, because they're blood. Um, we don't see this too much anymore in the U.S. because everybody uses ivermectin and it is pretty effective against these particular agents. In the colon, the adult male and females will copulate and the females will lay eggs, which are passed out in the feces into the internal uh, environment. And then we go through new, another cycle in which uh, it's about six to seven months, the whole prepatent cycle in these animals. But this is the last, the, the adult stage of Strongylus vulgaris. Now, a common incidental finding that we will see in horses on a fairly regular basis is called hemomelasma ilii. These are two cross sections from two different horses where we have these large bruised like areas on the serosa of the intestine. Sometimes they'll be black or red or blue or even green. Um, it's a multifocal lesion and it is usually the result of hemorrhage, mineral deposition, and fibrosis. Uh, for many years, people have said that this is due to strongyle migration um, because strongyles do migrate along the wall of the gut. Um, there is a strongylus edentatus, a related parasite that that will migrate in the uh, subperitoneal 
abdominal flank wall and cause a similar lesion, but nobody has ever been able to, uh, to actually pull larval strongyles out of this lesion. Um, I like that uh, uh, Dr. Fabio Del Piero from LSU many years ago said that he believed these were the result, it was bruising as a result of stretching of the gut or overstretching of the gut. And, and we know that horses produce a lot of gas, they, they eat from animal feed. Uh, I'm sure from time to time they get a bellyache and their, their gut is stretched by gas production. Um, to the point where you may have some bleeding on the outside and then the gas passes on and it goes back to normal. Um, and because of the relatively common nature of this, uh, and you will see it in animals that are on good warming programs, I do like that theory. It's never been proven, but I think that uh, Dr. Del Piero's theory is as good as anybody else's uh, in the formation of hemomelasma ilii. Worms, more worms, lots of worms. Uh, I probably should have put this up a little further in the presentation, but we're keeping the worms together. And these are ascarids. And ascarids are most commonly seen in most animal species in the duodenum. Um, they are ingested, the, the eggs will hatch out in the duodenum, and then the larva will go on a, a walkabout in the body in most animal species including uh, uh, dogs and pigs and foals um, the l3 larva will migrate around the body we call it visceral larval migrants and they tend to to migrate in heaviest numbers through the lungs so in severe cases the animals may show respiratory signs these are called summer colds in foals but you will see nodular lung lesions uh, with abundant eosinophils if you look at them histologically. And if you catch them early, you will see the larva within them. Eventually, they migrate back uh, into the wall of the gut and come out at the duodenum where they're seen in heaviest numbers. Um, it's funny when you get a big uh, aggregate of these, especially if you incise one or two, ascarids have a very sweet smell to them. Um, in the vast majority of cases, they, they are, are treated well with, with common warmers and they don't cause much of a problem. They're passed out. In very severe cases, they can result in, in colic, in obstruction, and even in perforation if one end of, uh, of the ascarid is uh, anchored and it can't move, can't be pushed down through into another position then the gut will continue to constrict around it and you can actually, it acts like a linear foreign body and you can actually wear a hole in the side of the intestine from a, uh, a ascarid like any other linear foreign body. Okay, one of the other uh, uh, helminth or cestode parasites here of the uh, small intestine is Paranoplocephala mammalana. We're going to talk about a much more common uh, uh, parasite uh, when we get to very shortly into the cecum. Um, people call them either Paranoplocephala or Anoplocephala, and I don't know what the better name is. I usually like to save a little time. I will call them Anoplocephala mammalana, and these are. Uh, cestodes of the stomach and the small intestine and the horse is the intermediate uh, uh, I'm sorry the whole the horse is the definitive host and the intermediate host is the orobatid mite or the forage mite and these are mites that are omnipresent and ubiquitous they live in hay and they live in plant material so the animal will eat these digest the mite and the the immature cestode will be released. There is another species that also lives in the intestine called Anaplocephala magna. That's a big one um, and can get up to 80 centimeters long. So these are ones that are transmitted by forage mites. And we're gonna talk just a minute about uh, the more common 
one that lives in the cecum anaplacephala perfoliata. Okay, I'm finishing up with the neoplasms of the intestine. Um, remember that there are a couple of forms that can affect the intestine of lymphoma in the horse. Um, you have the alimentary form of the lymphoma, which usually affects the proximal intestine uh, and lymph nodes in that area, usually the duodenum. And this is one that histologically very commonly looks like uh, plasma cells. They usually are restricted to the upper small intestine. You also see them in the pancreas at well. And because they're so plasmacytic, you may see a concomitant heavy chain paraproteinemia or hemolytic anemia. And it's thought maybe that these evolve from chronic inflammation in that segment. We certainly know that a lot of lymphomas can arise as a result of, of chronic inflammation, especially uh, in the intestine. We see maltomas or B-cell tumors of the, the stomach in humans. Um, and so maybe these have a tie-in. Uh, if we go further down the gut to the colon, there is another form, not plasmacytic, of B-cell tumor, which is, has been referred to in the past as the abdominal form affecting the colon and the uh, the lymph nodes of the of the colon itself and then finally there's the multicentric form which is going to do whatever it's going to do in horses it could hit the gut it could hit the liver the spleen the skin um, and that's one or the other nowadays we tend to uh, classify them much more uh, by immunophenotype uh, in horses diffuse large B cell tumors are the rule uh, in, in uh, the intestine, although you will see some epitheliotropic T-cell lymphomas. They're pretty rare, but you can see them in the horse as well. Finally, not a true tumor of the intestinal tract, but it uh, causes and wrecks havoc on the intestinal tract, an uncommon cause of colic and of death due to GI distress but uh, this is a mesenteric lipoma, a fatty tumor, or it could simply be an area of the mesentery which is twisted, resulting in fat necrosis. But if it is large enough and it becomes free, it can wrap itself around a loop of gut, and that's what's happened. This particular tumor probably had a long stalk, and as the animal ran around or as it laid and rolled around, um, it began to twist and it twisted around this loop of gut resulting in a secondary twist and this venous infarction. Look, remember we talked about how it looks like when in incarcerated gut always is inflated because of the gas production and we're seeing this. So we're seeing this is a mesenteric lipoma with secondary venous infarction. Some people call them strangulating lipomas. That's fine too, I suppose. Okay, before we get too far away from, from uh, uh, helmets, we are now moving into the cecum. And at the ileocecal valve, is, we will f often find a, uh, a, a group of these attached cestodes. They do attach. This is uh, Anaplocephala perfoliata, once again from the orobatid or the forage mites, and they normally will will attach at the ileocecal valve. How they know that that's the ileocecal valve, I don't know. Must be some particular pH or something like that they like. But uh, most people say that they don't cause problems, and they don't cause a lot of problems. But sort of like bots, which also attach, um, you can get. Uh, areas of hyperkeratosis, you can get uh, secondary infections or abscesses. Um, they don't tend to perforate, um, so I have not seen that. They often, I think, get a bad rap um, because cecal inversion or in the susception of the cecum where it sort of turns itself out 
is often seen and there's no predisposing cause. And so people have said, well, it's got to be these cystodes at the entrance of the cecum causing it. But they're pretty innocuous. Um, some people said, hey, th this is the cause of this distal ileal hypertrophy. But if you've seen an aggregate of these, they usually um, don't take up a lot of room. So I can't imagine they form much of an obstruction. But they do, um, they do get that bad rep and uh, they do cause some mucosal ulceration and potential damage associated with that. So not totally innocuous, but certainly not deserving of the reputation that they have. Oh, this is a pretty white foal, but not one that you want to see turn up on your farm or to invest in because unfortunately within a week or two, he's probably going to die of screaming colitis. The condition is known as the lethal white foal syndrome, which is a bad a name for a bad disease, or equine colonic aganglionosis. Um, this is seen in the white foals that are, are occasionally thrown as a result of mating Appaloosas or paints, which have a uh, autosomal recessive gene. The parents will both have uh, a mutation of the endothelin B receptor and the animals that are homozygous will be not only albine, they're not really albinos, they're very color diluted. They may have a little bit of pigment around the eyes or around the nose, but whenever you see albinism, remember that albinism is a birth defect and birth defects come together in clusters and albinism itself is uh, a neural, a defect in the migration of cells from the neural crest, which populate a lot of parts of the body. And these also give rise to the neurons within the various plexes, which innervate the gut. And so these animals have minimal innervation um, in the areas of minimal innervation, you have uh, a muscular hypoplasia because muscle has to be innervated to develop. And so you'll have segments of the guts of these animals that uh, uh, will be markedly decreased in size. As we look at, at one of these um, guts, you can see that the colon is quite small. But you sort of expect it as it grows, but but then you get into the small colon in which it's mostly just a band of fibrous connective tissue and nothing is going to pass. There's really no muscle there to pass uh, material through. This one looks a little better. Um, so you're going to have a combination when this animal's put down of meconium and probably not even any feed stuff. But the, the myenteric plexus is mostly affected. Um, and you can see this lesion anywhere from the terminal ilium, and that doesn't look all that great, um, to the cecum and the colon. So there is also a form of megacolon associated um, with decreased cells in the myenteric plexa in Clydesdale folds um, in a paper uh, out of Australia a number of years ago mentioned that. But this is the lethal white foal syndrome, a, uh, a defect in the uh, endothelin B receptor. For proper development of the gut, you need a couple of things, including glial-derived neurotrophic factors and the endothelin 3 gene product, and they just don't have it. Okay, great lesion here um, in a, a fairly common uh, infectious disease of foals. And the lesions are called volcano ulcers. We're looking at the mucosa of the colon, and you can see that there are these ulcers which are narrow at the top and then expand at the base. That's why they call them volcano ulcers. Narrow at the top and, and sort of underrun at the base. These are granulomas or pyogranulomas that are full of necrotic debris and the outside is the rest of the granuloma. And this is due to enteric rhodococcus equi infection. Rhodococcus equi is a primary uh, pulmonary disease. Um, 
But what will happen in about half of the cases of rhodococcosis in foals is they will cough, they will cough up these uh, acid fast organisms. Rhodococcus is closely related to myco mycobacterium, has the uh, a lot of the same products in the wall that make it very difficult to break down like mycolic acids and uh, which also give it its acid fastness and so they will cough these up and they will swallow them and they will set up shop in the colon especially over pyres patches they cause granulomatous lymphadenitis on the outside of the uh, gut so all of the colonic lymph nodes which line the, the colon and the cecum will be enlarged so this is an ulcerative and granulomatous uh, intracolic lymphadenitis now here's something that looks a lot like it and I'll throw this in as a differential diagnosis but it's a lot less common uh, and this is strep equi infection. We've talked in the hematopoietic lecture about streptococcus equi and, and how 80% of the cases remain restricted to the, the, uh, uh, the head and the neck, especially the lymph nodes, but about 20% of those cases will escape. The uh, equi will, the lymph nodes will rupture into the, to the vasculature and will get loose in the body and they also tend to hone in on pyres patches so you could see strep equi or maybe later on strep zo which tends to come and knock strep equi out you could culture that from this but when you see these classic these aren't the volcano ulcers that we see with classic rhodococcus in uh in foals um, rhodococcus, the great granulomas, they have their casial calcareous uh, granulomas, they have a lot of mineral in them, um, and it's a, it's a great lesion. I also mentioned that uh, um, they would affect the lymph nodes of the mesentery and along the outside of the colon. So what we're seeing, normally we don't see them uh, attain this size, but these are all infected with rhodococcus, we have pyogranulomus lymphadenitis, and we look through the wall of the gut, you can see those volcanic ulcers even from the outside. Young animal, I'm going, I see this picture, I am going with rhodococcus equi. If it's an old animal, I'm going with strep equi, because rhodococcus is, is the province of the young four to six to eight month old foal. Just a close up of one of those lymph nodes. Young rhodococcus, older, thinking about strep equi. Now, 5%, now 5 of cases of rhodococcus will be enteric only and not show any pulmonary involvement. And very rarely you can see solitary pyogranulomas in, in the abdomen or the brain or the, the, in the absence of anything else. But that's a pretty rare, pretty rare occurrence. As we go into the colon, boy, this is a mess. And this is a, a disease that has been around for a long time. It's usually associated with uh, stressed horses, performance horses. You can see it after endurance races, and you see just tremendous necrosis and hemorrhage uh, throughout the colon and cecum. Um, it has been called colitis X. Uh, just referring to the fact that nobody's been able to come up with a consistent cause of this. Uh, a number of pathologists will call this exhaustion colitis, which might uh, have more to do with the pathogenesis. But a number of agents uh, have been isolated, uh, including Salmonella, Clostridium, um, but it's also seen in overworked horses. Or horses have gotten a lot of nonsteroidal, so there doesn't seem to be any type of uh, a cohesive disease to result in this disease of a very characteristic appearance. The animals have a sudden onset of profuse, watery, often hemorrhagic diarrhea, and they rapidly become endotoxic and hypovolemic.
Okay, here's a, a colon that is extremely edematous, and there's not a whole lot else going on. Um, your rule outs are going to be uh, salmonella. I want to always remember salmonella. Anytime the colon or the intestine looks off, you want to put salmonella in there because it's going to look like anything. I think maybe an early displacement um, you, that has reduced itself could look like this. Um, colitis X could look like this without so much hemorrhage. But the, the, one, the agent that I want to talk about here is something that we don't see much anymore. It's a very popular disease, especially on the East Coast back in the 90s. And this is Potomac Horse Fever. Um, it's gone by a number of other names, including equine monocytic ehrlichiosis, which is a, a great descriptive name. And one of my personal favorites, the, the Shasta River Crud. And it's caused by... Um, a bacterial agent called Neorickettsia rustichii. It used to be Rickettsia rustichii, and then it be, or Ehrlichia rustichii, then it became Rickettsia rustichii. Now it's Neorickettsia rustichii, but that's just the nature of microbiologists. They get a little bored and they start changing the names of bacteria. It is associated with uh, the flukes that are found in freshwater snails. Um, and many of these uh, bacteria often have a arthropod, like mayflies or dragonflies, but an arthropod host has not been associated with a neorickettsia. It is an obligate intracellular bacteria which infects monocytes. And the effects in cells are most often seen in the colon and the cecum. Um, the organism has to utilize the energy production uh, mechanism of the monocytes and they will proliferate and infect additional monocytes and eventually in severe cases can actually infect the glandular epithelium of the cytoplasm resulting in uh, cellular exfoliation. They stain pretty well with uh, silver stains like a Steiner stain or a Dieterle stain. They're not contagious as you can imagine horse to horse um, like you would see with with salmonella or clostridium and the horses usually are spending time in summer or fall near bodies of water some horses don't show many signs at all and just get a little bit of fever some horses will get uh, a profuse watery non-fetid as opposed to salmonella um, diarrhea but in some cases it can result in endotoxemia we've talked about exfoliation of the mucosal lining of the gut so you can absorb endotoxins through there and then these animals the endotoxemia predisposes them to founder so it's sort of a cascade of uh, symptoms in the unlucky individuals but a lot of animals will show minimal signs so uh, neorickettsia rustichii uh, potomac horse fever this is a great picture of a, a lesion that is associated with non-steroidal anti-inflammatories it is worse in young horses it's worse in ponies uh, it's worse than any animals that have a concurrent disease or dehydration and we've seen the lesions that non-steroidal anti-inflammatories will cause in the uh, uh, in the the mouth and the uh, stomach, we will see them ultimately in the kidney when we get there. But throughout the GI tract, there are a number of places uh, in the pylorus uh, where you will get ulceration due to the inhibition of prostaglandin E2 and I2 alpha, which are required um, to maintain patency of vasculature in certain areas of the gut. And the right dorsal colon is probably one of the areas that is hit the most often, um, but it tends to uh, show the least clinical signs unless you get a really severe case of ulceration like we have here. This is in a reparative phase right now, but you can see the tremendous amount of mucosa that's been lost. And remember, when we lose that amount of mucosa 
you can absorb a lot of toxins almost directly into the bloodstream. So these animals are at risk for endotoxemia. Obviously, this animal is going to be very colicky. You'll see other signs. Um, it's not going to want to eat because the ulcer's in the mouth. Um, and there'll be pain on swallowing. So, uh, And then, ultimately, you can have scarring and and an inhibition of peristalsis in this area and recurrent colics. So uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories cause a lot of lesions in a lot of areas, but remember the right dorsal colon as a spot that appears to be especially hard hit. Okay, here's another twist in the gut here in the colon, um, and you have inflation, you have venous infarction, and I probably would not mistake that for, uh, for an infectious disease. This one's pretty easy to tell. Okay, boy, the entire gut is twisted here. This was a, uh, a displacement through the epipelvic foramen, and you can see that the entire gut is uh, incarcerated. Now, there's also food material throughout the abdomen. What a mess this horse is. But when you think about it, um, the venous infarction is anti-mortem. Some of the inflation here is going to be anti-mortem, some is going to be post-mortem, and I would be happy to bet you a dollar to a donut that the rupture of the stomach was post-mortem. Remember, we've talked about post-mortem gastric ruptures, and when nothing is passing through and when you have so much gas, eventually you've got gas production in the stomach, eventually that's going to blow too. So, so when you look at this animal, uh, this was not an anti-mortem. You don't see this much. Animals rarely die with this much grass in their bellies if it's a true gastric rupture. So everything points to uh, incarceration here and then secondary gastric rupture. Hey, we come back to more worms. Here's a, a, a large strong uh Didn't photograph that well. Here's a couple more, but that's not what I want you to look at. I want you to look at the edematous nature of this colon. And I want you to look at all of these small little red spots. We'll give you another picture and take away those large strong giles. And this is a good one. It's a little more pale. And you can see that these red spots all contain a small strongyle. These are also called cyathostomes. And they will insist within the mucosa of the colon. And they often will go through a hypobiotic stage or a stage of arrested development. So they can stay in there. And supposedly they wait until the external environment is uh, is prepared. It's good. It's warm. Um, it's not not the not the middle of winter. So they wait till it's beneficial for their reproduction. Then they will all come out at once, resulting in colitis, um, and edema, and, and and diarrhea and dehydration. Um, I don't know how they know what's going on outside the horse, but you know the animal kingdom's pretty smart. So. Um, they're essentially, the adult small strongyles will live in the, the lumen and they're essentially non-pathogenic. The only time we get into trouble is when we have these large uh, infections of the immature worms which tend to pop out all at the same time. Um, the, there is a redness to the granulomas. They will cause mild granulomas inflammation, not a tremendous amount. And the problem is when we get these really large infections. Unlike the large strongyles, they tend not to be uh, susceptible to ivermectin. So you'll also hear them called cyathostomes. And uh, uh, the larval form do not are not affected and they can be in the larval form of the hypobiotic stage for over two years 
so they're just not touched by the ivermectin. So you get a big bad infection and, and it disrupts the intestinal motility and causes diarrhea and, and can cause some problems. Let's finish up the, the parasites of the gut. Remember I mentioned a couple of the estrongyl, estrongylus edentatus. This is a, a section of abdominal wall and you can see these large strongyls which get underneath the peritoneum and they they migrate around and they result in these sort of serpiginous bruise-like um, areas of, of hemorrhage and, and mineralization and fibrosis. You can see them in the peritoneal wall. You can see them in the walls of the gut, the cecum and the colon, occasionally in the pat patarenal ligament. It is probably a form of hemomelasma, but just not hemomelasma ilii. So this is strongylus edentatus, and this is some people's proof that uh, hemomelasma ilii is caused by strongyls, but it's never really been totally proven. Pinworms, Oxyurus equi, and this is one of the most common pinworms in domestic animals. You see um, these oxyurids within the distal colon, um, they result in um, they result in uh, pruritus uh, of the uh, rectum and the anus. And what happens is the, uh, the adult females, they don't really cause much of a problem in the rectum themselves, but they will come out and they will, they will come out of the anus and they will lay eggs um, on the anus and the perineum of affected animals. And it is pruritic and it's itchy and you'll see horses the, the fem this female has rubbed all of the hair off of uh, off of her uh, uh, perineum. Uh, you can easily identify this by putting some some masking tape or some cellophane tape over the perineum or scraping the area to find the presence of the eggs. Pinworms don't really cause much of a problem. Uh, it's unsightly, the owners don't like it, it's itchy for the animals, but pinworms in all of the uh, species that are affected, it usually causes almost no problems. The only species in which pinworms can, can really cause a problem are the great apes. Interestingly enough, in orangutans and chimps and gorillas that are infected with pinworms, it can cause a necrotizing prot proctitis. Um, and even perforation. So it's a real problem when the great apes, but every, every other animal species, including people, tolerate them pretty well. Well, we're winding down on this lecture. We have a couple of, uh, uh, we have one more worm. We have one tumor to uh, uh, look at, and this is, this one is Ceteria equina. Ceteria are uh, uh, helminth parasites, they're filarid, so you may see a microfilaremia in infected animals, but the adults generally live in the abdominal cavity, and they just sort of lay on the peritoneum, and they don't do much. Uh, deer have one called Ceteria yehi, one of my favorite helminth names, um, but this is Ceteria quina, and occasionally you'll find them in odd spots, usually in the abdominal cavity, but you can find them in the pleural cavity, uh, in the lungs, in the eye, in the scrotum, but they're usually pretty polite uh, worms that don't do much damage. Um, in the eye, obviously, you can have a uveitis, or, you know, that's not a good place for them, but it is a microfilarid parasite, it's a filaremia, so you, with the filarids tend to have probably more aberrant locations because the larvae circulate in the bloodstream, so they go everywhere, and it's a miracle they all come back and they live fairly harmlessly in the abdominal cavity. Don't have a lot of more tumors to talk about that affect the colon. Uh, There's a great picture by uh, Fabio Del Piero um, of a tumor that you will see in horses. We've already talked about lymphoma, and anytime I see a tumor in the gut of a horse, I'm gonna think about lymphoma. But uh, this is a tumor that generally arises in the muscularis or the serosa, so it arises on the outside and grows outward. These are gastrointestinal stromal tumor, and we see them in uh, not only in horses, but you can also see them in dogs and in uh, uh, macaques. They're derived from the interstitial cells of cajal, but they usually do not involve the mucosa in the horse. So um, on the outside, 
growing outward. Uh, these tend to be positive for C kit proteins, and I don't know if I've run, we have a new, uh, uh, very effective immunomarker for GISTs called DOG1. And uh, uh, it works very well on our dog gists, and I've yet to try it in a horse. I'd be interested to see if it worked on that. But classically, they are they are positive, like other species for C kit protein. Okay, well that brings us to the end of this lecture. It's an hour on small intestine colon, and that is a segment of the gut that probably deserves a lot more time than that. But I really appreciate you uh, listening to this lecture. I hope you found a couple of nuggets in there that uh, you can stick in your pocket and keep with you. Um, our next lecture is going to be on the uh, uh, the liver, the biliary tree, and the pancreas in the horse. So I look forward to giving that. And as always, I hope that you are enjoying wonderful health and are having a terrific holiday season. Take care now.